Psychology in Seattle. Hello and welcome to Psychology in Seattle. I'm your host, Kirk Honda, licensed therapist. Please like us on Facebook. Please subscribe to us on iTunes. And if you want to email us, send an email to contact at psychologyinseattle.com. That's contact at psychologyinseattle.com. We love hearing from our listeners, so send us a note. Today's episode is a highly technical episode, and I'm actually kind of going out on a limb here, taking a little bit of a risk, uh, because I don't know if anyone will enjoy this. Uh, I might just be wasting my time. People at minute three might just go, oh, this is so boring, and turn it off. So I'm taking a bit of a risk, so let me know if this actually appeals to you, because I like to do this sort of thing and uh, would love to do more, but um, if everyone hates it, then I won't do it. It's a case formulation, so it's very technical. I would imagine it would appeal to psychotherapists or people who are very interested in psychotherapy. So again, let me know if this is a good thing or a bad thing. If I don't hear from anybody, I'm probably just going to do it anyway because I like to do this sort of thing. (laughs) All right, here I go. This episode is a presentation of a case formulation of Gloria as presented in her session with Carl Rogers. Gloria is a woman in the 1960s who agreed to be filmed in the 1960s in a session with the renowned therapist Carl Rogers, and this film is very famous. You can see it on YouTube if you like. In fact, I recommend that you actually that you watch it before you listen to this podcast because this podcast will not make a lot of sense without having seen it already. And if you've seen it in the past, a long time ago, it might be good to watch it again. All right. So what is a case formulation? Therapists formulate an idea of what is going on with their clients, and they call these case formulations. It's like a summary of the client and their issues. The ultimate aim of a formulation is not to appear smart, but to increase the probability that the therapy for the client will be helpful for the client. Formulations help therapists help their clients. By understanding the uniqueness of the client and the specific nature of the client's issues, the therapist is better equipped to treat the client and the therapy is more likely to be successful. Therapists often develop formulations in their head without ever writing them down. In fact, that's what I do 99% of the time in my private practice. I simply don't have the time to write up formal formulations for all my clients. But sometimes it's useful to write it all out, to take the time to clarify what I believe, what I see in the client, what I'm looking for, and how I think people change, um, and how I might help that specific client. And before I go into the formulation of Gloria, I thought I should explain my theoretical orientation as it stands today. My theoretical orientation has changed a lot over the years, but in my approach to this case formulation, I will be utilizing an integrative approach called assimilative psychodynamic integration. At the core of this theoretical orientation lies contemporary relational psychodynamic theory, which includes elements from psychoanalysis, ego psychology, object relations, attachment theory, and self-psychology. So at the core, in terms of the way I see clients, the way I see how they operate, Operate, the way I conceive of how they operate, um, I see them through a psychodynamic lens. But assimilative psychodynamic integration allows for the use of techniques from other therapies, such as cognitive therapy, behavioral therapy, experiential therapy, and systems approaches, as they are helpful. The key difference separating relational from earlier models of psychoanalytic theory is the idea that the unconscious is formed by early relationships rather than by biological drives. Freudian psychoanalytic, classic psychoanalytic theory believed in by that biological drives drove our inner nature and our behavior and contemporary psychodynamic thinkers are more likely to believe in the idea that our unconscious and our personality is formed by early relationships. This model also diverges from traditional dynamic therapies in that therapists intervene actively in the client's cognitive abilities, behavior, affect, and interpersonal engagements. And the therapist changes the meaning and emphasis on insight as well. So instead of being a blank slate and not reacting and just being a vessel for the client's transference, Contemporary psychodynamic therapists are more engaged the way that you might think of a a therapist being engaged. 
This is an assimilative integrative model in that it has a solid single theoretical foundation, relational psychodynamic theory, while remaining open to incorporating techniques from other therapeutic approaches. Central to this model is the traditional psychoanalytic notion that past experiences, whether painful or lovely, influence our thinking, behavior, and emotional experience, and often unconsciously influence us. So the foundation of assimilative psychodynamic integration is contemporary relational psychodynamic theories of personality structure, psychopathology, and psychological change. But the integration also includes the use of other methods and interventions from other therapeutic models. Cognitive methods are used to alter clients' unhelpful interpretations. For example, if a client tells me that he walked into the break room and everyone stopped talking, and he's 100% sure that everyone was talking crap about him, and this led him to feeling hurt and angry, I might explore other possible inter interpretations of that event, like perhaps they just hit a particular quiet moment in the conversation, and these other possible interpretations will lead to him feeling different, not hurt and angry, and this might lead to him having a more satisfactory life. That's what cognitive therapy, in a nutshell, involves. That's just one example from the infinite uses of cognitive therapy. Assimilative psychodynamic integration also includes experiential interventions, which I use often. These interventions involve working in the here and now. They often involve emotional expression and awareness. Experiential therapies promote taking responsibility. The client might appreciate being confronted on what they are responsible for. This is often associated with Fritz Perl's work. Experiential techniques include Carl Rogers' unconditional positive regard, being warm and mirroring the client's experience in therapy. Experiential humanistic interventions include things like the integration of conflictual parts of the self. For instance, someone might have a part of them that wants to leave a marriage while the other wants to stay, and Gestalt therapy provides techniques to explore that conflict and movement toward a resolution. And Gestalt therapy is an experiential humanistic therapy. And lastly, assimilative psychodynamic integration allows for the use of systemic interventions. This is a complicated area of therapy, but briefly, it sees people as being embedded in a system of relationships rather than as pure individuals. It looks at and intervenes upon the roles that people play in their families, the rules that govern the relationships, the context within which people live, the cultural context, the transgenerational patterns of families, the circular causality of recursive patterns, among other ideas. There are many useful therapies under the systemic umbrella, including narrative therapy, emotion-focused therapy, social constructivism ideas, strategic family therapy, and many more. But again, at the foundation of assimilative psychodynamic integration lies the notion that people's personalities are formed by important attachment figures, usually in their childhood. But cognitive, experiential, and systemic techniques can be used as needed. Now, this is just my theoretical orientation as it stands today. God knows what I'll be thinking in a number of years from now. I often vacillate between psychodynamic ideas and humanistic ideas. Currently, I'm a believer that our personalities are formed by our attachment figures, but sometimes I feel like we can invent ourselves anew at any given time, that we're just basing our stories upon things that have happened in the past that were um, attached to a particular story. And if we rewrite that story, that we can basically reinvent ourselves to some extent. And that idea flies in the face of psychodynamic theory. So I don't know. It's, it's, hard, it's hard to know what is right. And of course, all of this is just a construction anyway. It's all just philosophy. It's not really a science, uh, even though psychology would like to claim it to be. But it, I don't think that it is. All right, so the following case formulation, as mentioned earlier, is based on Carl Rogers' session with Gloria. I limited this formulation to only the information gathered from that one 30-minute session with Rogers. And we at Psychology in Seattle had an episode on that session, along with episodes on her sessions with Pearls and with Ellis, so listen to those if you like. Okay, so oftentimes in the f uh, beginning of a case formulation, the therapist will state the presenting problem. Some might say it's a little simplistic. Uh, others might say um, it should always be very simple. But um, at any rate, that's what I'm starting this case formulation upon. Uh, I am saying that Gloria requested psychotherapy with Rogers to help her decide whether or not to tell her nine-year-old daughter, Pammy, the truth about Gloria's post-divorce sexual activity. 
So Gloria came in to Rogers saying that she did not know what to do regarding her daughter, her nine-year-old daughter named Pammy. Um, Gloria was saying that she was having sex after her divorce with other men. She was dating other men and having sex with them. And she, she wanted to know whether or not she should tell her daughter about this sexual activity. Her daughter uh, presumably knew that Gloria was dating other men and the daughter, Pammy, was seeing Gloria with these men. But Gloria felt ashamed of having sex and didn't want to tell that to, to Pammy, but felt that she was also lying to Pammy by not telling her. So that was the problem that Gloria brought to therapy. My guess is, is that if Gloria were to continue to work with Carl Rogers or some other therapist for some extended period of time, that the presenting problem would be more complex than that, um, deeper than that, uh, in my opinion. But um, that's the thing she presented in this session. So that's what we'll go with. All right. So the next thing to look at is the precipitants. So this involves the things that precipitated the presenting problem. It's sometimes useful for clinicians to note, assess, and remember those things that happened just before the problem occurred as a way of understanding the problem. One of Gloria's precipitants was her divorce. Gloria was recently divorced uh, from her husband, and she said it was her choice to do so. Another precipitant to therapy was having sex without love. She stated that she feels guilty when she has men over to the house, presumably to have sex. She says that she has sexual desires that drive her to do things that she feels guilty about. She feels guilty for having sex with men she is not in love with. That's what she said. She stated that she hates herself for being a bad person for having sex. Um, the third precipitant to therapy was the quote unquote lying to Pammy. Gloria reported that her daughter recently asked her if she had ever had sex with a man besides Pammy's father, Gloria's ex-husband. So her daughter asked, Hey mom, have you had sex with anyone else except for daddy? Gloria told her daughter that she was not having sex with the men she was dating. Um, which is not true. Gloria reported with to, to Rogers that this put her in a quote unquote double bind. That's the phrase she used in which she either had to one be dishonest and protect her young daughter from the truth of Gloria's quote unquote devilish behavior. That's the word she used devilish or two be truthful and risk rejection and judgment from her daughter, Pammy. Um, and if it's not clear what name I'm saying, I'm saying Pammy as in Pam as in Pamela, but Pammy, like Tammy, Pammy. Anyway, Gloria does not know which option is better. She doesn't know whether or not to be dishonest to her daughter and protect her from the information or to be truthful and risk rejection and judgment or potential trauma to her daughter for knowing about her mother's sexual life. Gloria wants to feel comfortable with whichever option she chooses. And she said she desperately wants her daughter to fully accept her and her sexuality. She told Rogers in the session with Rogers that she wished he as an authority would tell her to risk telling Pammy the truth. She admits she does not want the responsibility of the consequences of her decision. She said she worries that she will traumatize her children with the knowledge of her sexual life. She later stated that she hates herself because she is lying to Pammy. All right. So those are the precipitants to the presenting problem. All right. The next thing that I assessed in my case formulation is strengths or ego strengths. Um, to non-psychodynamic people, they would say strengths, and to um, psychodynamic people, they might call them ego strengths. One ego strength of Gloria's is that she is coming into therapy, which shows that her ego is strong enough to withstand possible judgment. Being in therapy exposes you to possible judgment, to possible rejection. Um, you could open yourself up to a therapist, and the therapist could uh, say, wow, you are crazy or wow, you're stupid or wow, you're ter you're a terrible person. Now that's not a common therapist reaction, but I would say it's a common fear for clients and for people. Um, and she is able to overcome that fear and come into therapy. So that indicates a strong enough ego. She was quickly able to be vulnerable with Rogers, which shows a non borderline level of personality organization. 
So it's another psychodynamic terminology. She, she does not have a borderline level of personality organization because she is able to be vulnerable with Rogers. Also, she frequently owned her feelings of guilt rather than blaming others. Instead of saying, everyone else is making me feel guilty, she just said, I feel guilty. It's, it's my guilt. Additionally, she showed a good level of self-awareness when she, rather than being passive, openly admitted she wanted Rogers to tell her what to do. So rather than passively trying to suck Rogers into a position of telling her what to do, Gloria just admitted it. She said, you know what? I really just want you to tell me what to do, which indicates self-awareness. She knows that's what she wants, and she's not afraid to admit that to somebody. Gloria appears to have a moderately healthy ability to mentalize. That is the ability to understand people in terms of their inner worlds, the ability to know the difference between her perception of others and the reality of others. So that's the ability to mentalize. Gloria appeared to have a good ability to do that. Gloria exhibited other notable ego ego strengths, including good impulse control, intact judgment, and consistent reality testing. Um, Some might debate that, but I like to look on the bright side when it comes to clients, and so that's what I see in Gloria. All right, so now that we've gone over the presenting problem, the precipitance, and the ego strengths, let's move on to object relations. Now, for those of you who are not clinicians, um, if you're still listening to this boring case formulation, object relations involves the relations that people have or we have with our objects, which sounds kind of weird, but um, it's a Freudian term for important people in our lives. So they really should just call them relationships, but in psychodynamic terms, uh, we use the terminology object relations, um, meaning our uh, meaning an assessment of Gloria's relationships with her significant attachment figures in her childhood, mainly her parents. So let's talk about her father first. Gloria said she enjoyed hurting her father by telling him she works as a waitress and goes out with men. She gloated with Rogers at the way she got revenge on her father by making him upset. This suggests some meaningful level of historical negativity between Gloria and her father. It is my guess that her father was emotionally distant, but I have little data to back this claim, so it, it's merely an early hypothesis to guide inquiry. Again, basing this on 30 minutes of talking with Rogers doesn't provide us with a lot of data to go on. But that's an early hypothesis based on her statements. Going on to her mother, if Gloria did indeed feel rejected by her father, this might have created a need for her mother to be all good in Gloria's eyes. We all need a secure parent to depend upon when we're young and vulnerable to the world. I don't know if you can remember what it's like to be an infant or to be a toddler or to be a young child, but it's an extremely scary world to children. They don't know how to move through the world without the help of a parent. They don't know how to feed themselves. They don't know how to uh, get anywhere. They don't know how to communicate with, with people. So in my opinion, they're set up dispositionally to depend on parents and have extreme anxiety if they feel they can't depend on a parent. So it's my guess that she felt she couldn't depend on her father and therefore needed at least one of her parents to be all good so she could have uh, the comfort of knowing that one parent was was all good. And so my guess is, is that she idealized her mother. Now, again, this is just a hypothesis. So I'm guessing that her mother was idealized in Gloria's eyes or split perhaps in defense of Gloria feeling emotionally abandoned by her father. Consequently, when Gloria discovers her mother is having sex with her father, Gloria demonizes her mother, splitting her mother and her mother's sexuality and suppressing it for fear of destroying the all-good mother. There's a moment in the session where Gloria talks about having discovered her mother's sexuality. Um, I think her mother tells Gloria that uh, she's having sex with her husband, Gloria's father. And Gloria is disgusted by this. So at this moment, it appears that Gloria is splitting off her mother, her bad mother, and, and preserving her good mother as someone who doesn't have sex, sort of as a fantasy in Gloria's mind. So Gloria's reaction might have been enhanced by the mainstream notion of sex and gender at that time. Traditionally, in American culture, women were 
looked down on if they were sexual. So this contextual factor might have played a role in Gloria's idealization of her mother. Mainstream society devalued sex outside of marriage, particularly for women. So Gloria remembers being disgusted with her mother's sexual life. This was a meaningful moment in her childhood that she brought up in her session with Rogers. She said she wished her mother would have been more open and honest about sex, actually. Gloria said if her mother had given her the opportunity to accept her mother's quote-unquote devilish side, Gloria might be able to accept her own sexuality today. And again, it'd be interesting to explore with Gloria what she means by devilish and what sort of Christian angel devil uh, association she has there. Um, is she just being playful with the word devilish or, or does devilish have truly evil associations? One hypothesis is that this early experience with her parents is being recreated in the present. This is a common object relations or psychodynamic interpretation. She has projected her young self object onto her daughter and her self-identity is ambivalently vacillating between the all-bad and the all-good mother objects. So again, let me just repeat that. She's projecting her young self-object, that that self uh, object, according to object relations theory, we introject our experiences when we're children, we internalize them, and we internalize a self-object and a other object. And when she was a child, she experienced her mother having sex with her father and, and this was difficult for her. So she internalized this dyad of herself and her mother. And so this creates inner conflict. So she might be projecting her self object onto her daughter and her self identity is ambivalently vacillating between the all bad and the all good mother objects. Gloria sees herself as all bad or all good rather than realistically seeing herself as mostly good. And that's why she is stuck. She feels justified in having sex with men, and she feels guilty uh, about having sex with men at the same time. And she is asking Rogers to help destroy one side of this this dichotomy. It is also possible that she has projected her internalized father object onto the ex-husband, thus completing the original triad from her childhood. This is also a systemic idea of triangulation and transgenerational triangles. In other words, um, remember earlier how I was hypothesizing that Gloria had a strained relationship with her father growing up. She also had an experience with her mother being all good and all bad, the all bad being the sexual mother and the all good being the uh, warm and, and forthcoming mother, the mother that tells Gloria what is going on. And she experienced herself as kind of caught in between and confused and rejecting her mother in some ways. She is recreating that triangle. Now she is in the mother's role and she has potentially projected this father figure onto her ex-husband. And she has now projected her self-child object onto her daughter. The similarities between the triangle is interesting, right? She, as a child, grew up experiencing this dichotomy and sexuality in your mother. And now she's re- recreated that situation for her daughter. Psychodynamic thinkers believe that we recreate our earlier experiences. And it seems that glory has done just that. This recreation has several psychic purposes. First, it is an attempt to rework the conundrum. It is a fresh new opportunity to correct the original wrong. If that makes any sense. The second psychic purpose for this recreation of the triangle, it is recreated to provide comfort for Gloria. We are comfortable with old models of relationships because they are familiar. Thirdly, Gloria might be recreating this original triad of her and her mother and her father because it gives Gloria relief from the tension of her inner object conflicts. So because of this inner triangle creating anxiety, inner anxiety and strife in her psyche, she projects it outward as a way of relieving that inner tension. She internalized this triad as a child and her ego suppressed the triad to protect her psyche from its pain. But the conflict continues to rage deep within her unconscious. Her ego exerts effort to keep the inner conflict bottled up. 
This effort fatigues the ego, so the ego projects part of the conflict outward, making the conflict external rather than internal. And for a time, Gloria's psyche can be distracted by an outside representation rather than having to face the pain of the inner battle. But this is merely an initial hypothesis, and therefore more in-session exploration is necessary with Gloria. All right, so we've looked at the presenting problem, the precipitants, the strengths, the ego strengths, and the object relations. Now let's go on to transference. Transference is when a client transfers their inner representation of their parents onto the client, or onto the therapist. Toward the end of the session, Gloria suddenly told Roger she would like him as a father. This is a very explicit representation of transference. Um, often uh, clients won't be as explicit with their transference, but um, Gloria um, presents in this way. As she said this, she, as she said she wanted Rogers as a father, she looked down, perhaps in embarrassment or perhaps in a regressive defense against her anxiety regarding the uncertainty of how Rogers felt about her. This is meaning, um, regressive meaning that she regressed to an earlier phase of development, a, a, a more submissive childlike phase uh, to uh, deal with the anxiety of Roger's potential rejection of her. But this transference of Gloria's is perhaps a healthy effort to internalize a good father object to counterbalance her internalized bad father object as internalized from her father. If allowed to play itself out with a therapist, Gloria's effort is likely to be fraught with complicated feelings and experiences which should be carefully considered when intervening by the therapist. For instance, once Rogers is established as a permanent candidate for Gloria's father projections, Gloria could begin to see Rogers as the bad father, the father whom she wants to rebel against and hurt. Now, this isn't a failure of therapy, but it's something that the therapist should be aware of as a predicted outcome of this sort of transference and to be ready for it and to treat it accordingly. All right, so we've talked about transference. Now let's talk about countertransference. The working definition of countertransference I like to use is that countertransference is any reaction a therapist has about the client, any feeling, any thought. It can be um, compassion or it can be anger toward the client. It, it can be noticed or it could be unconscious to the therapist. The therapist could know about it or they could be unaware of it. It can be helpful, it can be unhelpful, or it can have no effect at all. It can be related to the therapist's personal issues or it can be related to the particular mood the therapist is in at the time. Um, you know, the therapist didn't get sleep that the night before and is just sort of in a bad mood. Or it can be a thought or feeling that is provoked by the client. The client could be provoking this feeling thought or thought, this countertransference feeling in the therapist. It could be a, it could generate from the client. Sometimes therapists define countertransference as only being those reactions to a client's transference. That's the original definition is countertransference, as its name implies, is a reaction to transference specifically. In other words, when a client transfers their parent onto the therapist, what are the feelings and thoughts that emerge for the therapist? But I use a very broad definition of countertransference, as I mentioned earlier. It's important for therapists to notice their countertransference because unnoticed countertransference can become destructive to therapy. This is why therapists should always, always, always go through their own therapy. Therapists should enter therapy to discover and face the denied parts of themselves. Therapists need to know their triggers and their inner wounds. If they don't, they run the risk of distorting the client and of becoming overly reactive to clients and of burning out on the job, meaning their unresolved issues become triggered so often by clients that they can't tolerate being a therapist and become burnt out. Freud believed that any countertransference reaction meant that the psychoanalyst needed to re-enter psychoanalysis to make them completely non-reactive again. But contemporary therapists usually believe that countertransference is normal and can even be helpful. And that's what I believe. Countertransference can be a useful assessment tool. If a client provokes a particular feeling in a therapist, what does that say about the client's inner life? What dyad is the client enacting? What characteristic is the client trying to project onto the therapist? Also, countertransference can be useful when trying to emphasize something through an emotion that the, that the therapist is having. For example, depending on a therapist's orientation, they might want to self-disclose to their client that they are feeling sad or angry. 
The therapist tells the client that the therapist is feeling something for the client's benefit. For instance, if a client is being abused by her husband and she, say, is in denial of her anger for fear of the consequences of, of feeling that, that anger, and uh, consequently the therapist feels angry at the husband, this is a countertransference feeling. The therapist might believe that self-disclosing this anger will help the client. So he might say, I'm feeling a lot of anger right now. It makes me angry when I hear about you being unfairly abused. This might motivate the client to connect with her own anger. Um, but this is just one example. And there's a lot of debate about whether or not a therapist should self-disclose. And it should always be done with care. All right. If I imagine that I were in Roger's chair, I would mainly feel compassion for Gloria, and I would term this compassion as countertransference. She presents as a pleasant and a likable client, so it wouldn't be difficult to be compassionate uh, with her. I might also have felt a desire to give her advice and to take responsibility for her decisions. This would be both an enactment of her projective identification which I'll discuss later, and of my particular inner constructs based on my family of origin. So, so I might have this feeling that I want to take responsibility for her decision. She presents in a way that sort of sucks you in and wants you to give advice to her. And she's asking explicitly, tell me what to do. You're the smart one. You, you're, you're the one who knows. And I might feel that, that urgency to, to tell her what to do and to just, you know, uh, please her in this way. And this would be me playing into an enactment of her projective identification. But it's also particular to me. This is something that I've discovered through my own therapy that um, this is something that I might tend to do. Um, and I need to watch out for that, for, for fear of harming the therapy. I suspect I would have also felt protective of her daughter and angry at Gloria for not protecting her daughter from the intimate knowledge of Gloria's dating life. This, this too is likely a result of the intermingling of our complementary inner constructs, Gloria's and mine. When Gloria talks about telling her daughter about her sexual life and how she is just looking for an excuse to tell her daughter that she's having sex with these men, I would feel protective of her daughter because I would believe that this was reflective of perhaps an overall parenting deficit on behalf of Gloria. Since I feel naturally protective of young children, I, I might be angry at Gloria. So these feelings that I might have are to be noticed and evaluated for their assessment and therapeutic value. They're not to be uh, ashamed of. For example, my feeling of anger is likely a projection of her inner self-anger. If I feel this anger, I might inquire if she feels angry at herself in the moment. This would provide an in-session opportunity for her to process and integrate different aspects of herself, which is one of the goals of psychodynamic therapy. All right, so now on to defense mechanisms. Defenses are mechanisms that protect the psyche from harm. Defense mechanisms protect the self from difficulties and pain. One such defense is called projective identification. For an elaborate demonstration and explanation of projective identification, listen to the Psychology in Seattle episode about uh, projective identification. So um, I'll mention a few different defense mechanisms. The first is projective identification. As mentioned earlier, Gloria repeatedly asked Rogers to give advice to her. She really wanted him to tell her what to do. At one point later in the session, she said she felt as though Rogers was giving her unspoken permission to tell Pammy the truth about her sexuality, even though Rogers had given her no such evidence of that. So this might be an example of Gloria attempting to socialize or manipulate Rogers into conforming with her projected inner conflicted construct. When we have a conflicted inner dyad or object pair, our egos tend to make this inner conflict external, therefore temporarily relieving or distracting from the inner pain or anxiety. She appeared to have an internalized object pair of an incompetent self object and an advice giving parent object. Perhaps Gloria commonly experienced feeling incompetent as one or both of her parents gave demeaning advice, but this is just a hypothesis. In her attempt to purge herself of this inner conflict through projection, she is attempting to manipulate Rogers. This is the identification part of projective identification. Um, she is attempting to manipulate Rogers into playing the role of the advice-giving parent object. 
If Rogers had given in to this manipulation, Gloria would likely have been temporarily satisfied, but later resentful of Rogers' authority over her. When Rogers provides a new reaction to her projective identification, uh, not giving her advice, Gloria is given the opportunity to rework her inner constructs, which hopefully leads to Gloria feeling more confident in her decisions and less dependent. Although Rogers is not a psychodynamic therapist, in my opinion, his unconditional positive regard is an effective way of helping clients internalize a helpful object pair that includes caring and attention rather than demeaning advice giving. All right, another defense mechanism, the second one I'll talk about is idealization or splitting. Um, This is another defense mechanism that Gloria showed signs of employing. During the session, Gloria pushed Rogers to tell her what to do, as I stated earlier. But this behavior outside of the defense mechanism might have been enhanced by two societal elements at the time. One being that men were seen as being smarter than women, and therefore she would look to Rogers to help her since she might see herself as incompetent. And another is that mothers are to blame when children have issues. This idea is still prevalent today, but I think it was much more prevalent in the 60s. These are factors that play into this this issue for her. But uh, upon Roger's refusal to give advice, I hypothesize Gloria became secretly angry at Rogers for not complying with her projective identification. This anger and anxiety threatened to push Rogers away. So in an effort to salvage the connection, she idealized him. She split off the negative feelings and hence consciously saw Rogers as all good. Gloria was then compelled to say that she would like him as a father. But again, this is just an initial hypothesis based on a 30-minute session. So again, in summary, this is kind of complicated. Because Rogers did not comply with Gloria's projective identification of trying to get him to tell her what to do so she could feel dependent upon him and resentful, because he was not going along with her normal defense, This threatened her relationship with him, and her ego said, well, you have a choice here. You can either choose to reject him, or you can choose to split off those negative feelings that you're having about him right now and idealize him instead, to see him as all good, to basically overshadow the negative feelings you're having towards him because she, I think, probably wanted to have a connection with him. And this threw her over the fence into the all good category and of, uh, into seeing Rogers as all good. And suddenly she has this upwelling uh, warmth towards him and says that she would like him as a father. But it's hard for me to tell exactly what was going on. Um, I might be over pathologizing that statement, but anyway, that's uh, one, one idea. Projection is the last defense mechanism I saw strong evidence for in this session with Rogers. In a nutshell, projection is when someone attributes their unwanted characteristic, um, a thought or an emotion, onto someone else, but without the identification part of it, the part of the process by which the individual manipulates the other into agreeing with the projected quality. For instance, an angry, hostile person might see others as being hostile when they are not. An example of displacement, however, which is different than projection, using this same angry person, might dis- uh, this person might displace his anger at a boss onto the dog. He's angry at his boss, but he doesn't express it until he gets home and he kicks his dog instead. This is displacement, not projection. All right, so getting back to Gloria. Gloria said there's a woman at work that does not really know her. She mentioned this to Rogers. She said if others knew her better, they would judge her as bad and unlikable. If they really knew what she was up to, they would judge her as being a bad person and would not like her. This is potentially a projection employed by her ego to defend her from the knowledge that it is she who is capable of being judgmental and rejecting of others. By projecting this unwanted aspect of self, um, that is being judgmental and rejecting, onto her co-worker, Gloria is able to temporarily deny that she possesses this aspect herself. She might even go so far as to have sex with more men so she can more easily imagine judgment from others, and her ego can more easily project this aspect onto acquaintances, such as the people at work. However, this is mere speculation, and more explanation would be needed to really uh, solidify this hypothesis. All right, so we've discussed the presenting problem, we've discussed the precipitance, we've discussed the ego strengths, we've, ta- we, we've talked about her object relations, 
her transference, uh, the possible countertransference that I might have. Uh, we've talked about defense mechanisms. Let's go on to the last topic in a case formulation, and that is the treatment plan. Okay, now that we know all this stuff or have this idea of what the problem is and, and what underlies this problem for Gloria, what do we do about it? Um, this is the ultimate reason for the assessment. We don't create a case formulation just, just for fun. We do it so it can inform the treatment of Gloria. The ultimate purpose of therapy is to help the client change for the better. This purpose sounds simple, and sometimes it is simple, like when a client changes to a job he likes better, but for psychodynamic therapists, the definition of change can be quite complicated. And depending on your orientation or depending on how you see therapy, um, all of this might be debatable. And because psychodynamic formulations and treatment plans can be so complicated, it's why a lot of people loathe psychodynamic therapy, um, because they think that it's too unspecific and subjective. Psychodynamic goals have been accused as being mere fantasies of the therapist, and I suppose they are sometimes, but I've seen, or I believe I've seen, psychodynamic change occur in clients, so I'm a believer. All right, so at its foundation, psychodynamic psychotherapy involves listening to the client and attempting to discern the meaning of the client's story by bringing unconscious processes into conscious awareness through interpretations, the client can better manage their perceptions and reactions. And by utilizing the therapeutic relationship in a healing manner, the client can both diminish destructive inner constructs and bolster helpful inner constructs that will produce positive long-term outcomes outside of therapy. And by utilizing the therapeutic relationship in a healing manner, the client can both diminish destructive inner constructs and bolster helpful inner constructs that will produce positive long-term outcomes outside of therapy. Through the use of techniques such as free association, interpretation, inquiry, empathy, observation, and the analysis of defense, the analysis of transference. These are some of the major types of interventions used by psychodynamic therapists. So as Gloria attempted to recreate difficult past relationships with me, I would attempt to provide a reaction that bolstered her helpful inner constructs. For example, if Gloria attempted to create with me the incompetent, hurt, resentful self slash competent, hurtful, controlling other object pair, I would perhaps communicate in a meaningful manner that Gloria was competent and able rather than giving in to the temptation to control and give advice. This would hopefully bolster an alternative object pair, uh, one that involved a competent, mature self and a non-judgmental, encouraging other which I would hypothesize would make things better for Gloria. Over time, as this healthy object pair is bolstered, Gloria will decrease her enactments of the diminished unhealthy inner construct, and she would have more contentment in her decisions and her self-image. Over time, as this healthy object pair is bolstered, Gloria will decrease her enactments of the unhealthy inner construct, and she will have more contentment in her decisions and her self-image. Furthermore, I would help Gloria become aware of her ego defenses and her inner constructs and how they affect her behavior, perceptions, and feelings. I would attempt to be empathic, understanding, and non-judgmental. I would work at her pace and not expose her to too much too early. This is an important thing to do as a therapist. I would also confront her when necessary. Clients often appreciate or they say they appreciate that I am confrontational at times. I'm not yelling at them, but um, I'm not afraid to risk rejection by the client by pointing out something that I see. And through this careful and respectful process, hopefully change will occur and her ego would use the defense mechanisms less often because, they, because her, her ego wouldn't need to use them. I would also intervene in an attempt to integrate parts of her psyche that she is denying, splitting, and or projecting. Through empathic interpretation and through experiential cathartic release, she might be able to accept previously unacceptable self aspects. For example, when I notice a countertransference feeling, I might ask if she is currently attempting to deny that particular feeling within herself. I would help her process the meaning of this denied feeling with the hopes of her accepting it. This would lead to an integrated self, a more realistic perspective of self and others, and better relationships, or at least as the theory goes. All right, oh, so there you go. There's my rather long psychodynamic case formulation of Gloria and my treatment plan. 
Now, I should say that I don't see all clients through this lens and don't use psychodynamic therapy with all clients. As mentioned earlier, I use an assimilative integrated model of psychotherapy that involves cognitive, experiential, and systemic ideas and techniques. For instance, I could see a case formulation of Gloria being entirely based on culture, meaning that all of her so-called problems are a result of an oppressive, sexist, Puritan American culture that pathologizes divorce and, and female sexuality. And through therapy, she was seeking a paternal figure to grant her permission to live her life. And if I based my formulation on these ideas, which I, which I might, then the treatment is not to look at Gloria's inner life, to not pathologize her inner life, but to free her from the constructions that are oppressing her and to uh, help her with developing her own identity uh, free from oppression. Another angle, uh, in addition to psychodynamic theory, in addition to multiculturalism or systemic thinking, another angle worth exploring is the purely cognitive angle. To a cognitive therapist, all her problems are due to the way she chooses to see things. Her social construction of sexuality and of parenting are unhelpful and, if changed, would change the way she felt and behaved. She could choose a different way of seeing things, a way that is more adaptive. But perhaps that discussion is for another episode. All right, so if you've made it this far, then you're either asleep and I am now speaking to you in your dreams, or if you're still awake, you were interested enough in this episode to stay tuned. So let me know, uh, because like I said earlier, this is a topic that I would imagine would bore most people and uh, probably not worth bothering people with. You can email me at contact at psychologyinseattle.com. That's contact at psychologyinseattle.com. All right, well, that does it for another episode of Psychology in Seattle. Please take care of yourself.